Good morning, my friends. Thank you for gracing the American Enterprise Institute this morning. We have the good fortune to learn from three of the sparkliest stars in the AEI firmament this morning, Derek Scissors, Hal Brands, and Michael Beckley. And to talk about that outstanding book, Danger Zone, uh, just out from Michael and Hal. And it is my favorite fingerprint of the culture of the American Enterprise Institute that um, this subject is being prosecuted for and against in this very house, right? The most important conversation about China policy, the most rigorous examination of the data and arguments in Michael and Hal's book is actually coming from inside the house. Um, and we, have, we are gonna uh, talk to them about the book this morning. Let me go straight down this murderer's row batting order. Um, Michael Beckley is a professor at Tufts University, a fellow here at AEI. He was educated at Emory University and PhD from Columbia. He is doing outstanding work on how to think about measures of great power. Um, and if you haven't heard the interview he gave to NPR about the book last week and about the way his Japanese American family's history influences his thinking about the international order, it is incredibly powerful and beautiful and I commend it to you. How brands is the most diabolically productive scholar <laughs> in this field. Um, and he would be murdered on the third floor of this building if he weren't such an outstanding colleague. He educated at Stanford PhD from Yale in the Grand Strategy Program. He's written 157 influential books on the subject. <laughs> and no, none of us who work on strategy um, incorporate history to better effect and more honestly than Hal Brands. And third up, the good and great Derek Scissors. Um, he worked his way westward in his education, starting at Michigan, then graduate work at Chicago, his PhD from Stanford. He is the chief economist for the China Beige Book since 2013, and a member of the uh, US-China Economic and Security Commission. And in the pages of Foreign Affairs, he offered, along with Oriana Schuyler Mastro, also from this institution, the most robust challenge to the ideas of this book. Okay, Michael and Hal, start us off. <laughs> You'd think we'd be like more in sync by this point. <laughs> Spend so many long in walks the midst on the beach of the together. Juggernaut <laughs> of publicity for this book. I should say it was excerpted in the Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. and in. Uh, foreign policy. They wrote about it in Foreign Affairs. It's been blurbed in The Economist, parenthetically also citing Derek's objections to their arguments, <laughs> and in The Financial Times just in the last couple of days. Come on, guys. Uh, okay, so I think, I think we'll start by saying that um, the, the basic idea is just that China is in a different point in its trajectory as a great power, you know, in the 90s and 2000s. Michael, I'm when... sorry, can I stop you? I forgot something important. Sure. Important. Um, this book talk, like so many others at AEI, is the result of the beneficence of the Edward and Helen Hintz um, uh, program, which brings authors of national importance to discuss particularly significant books here at AEI. Okay, now. <laughs> <laughs> so China is in a different part of its trajectory as a great power. Uh, it's not, you know, you have a slowing economy over the last decade or so. It's the longest slowdown of the post-Mao era. Growth rates fall more than 50% in the 2010s. And then you have COVID, which drags it down by another two thirds. Now you have zero COVID, um, which is really putting a lot of pressure on the economy. And at the same time, you've had the bubbling up of more strategic pushback on Beijing. Um, Anti-China sentiment has, has soared to levels we haven't seen since the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre, and it's manifesting itself in all kinds of ways that are making life more difficult for the Chinese, everything from just the steady emergence of a, a, a distinct Taiwanese identity, where you have more and more people there that just don't even consider going back with the mainland. You have Japan 
starting to rebuild and build up its military. You have popping up of essentially explicitly anti-China alliances in the form of the Quad and AUKUS. Um, and you have the United States, which you know, for so long had engaged China, but now is uh, you know, walling itself off with various trade and investment barriers and building up its military. And so uh, you know, the Chinese, I, we think that this fundamentally changes the decision calculus in Beijing. In the 90s and 2000s, when so much of the rest of the world was just so enthralled by the money to be made uh, in China, uh, they were fast-tracking China's integration with international institutions, opening up markets, um, and basically paving the way for China to conduct a peaceful rise strategy. Now, leaders in Beijing can no longer count on such easy access to the rest of the world. They can't count on an economic engine that will just give them a gravy train of patronage they can dole out to uh, various factions within China, as well as to shower money abroad to win hearts and minds there. And so uh, we've seen this historically that when rising powers confront these kind of headwinds, they have, to, they, they have two choices. They can either sit back and do nothing and allow the new normal of slower growth and growing encirclement to play itself out, or they can take decisive actions to try to rejuvenate their economies, to beat back rivals, to try to accomplish long-standing national aims before it becomes too late. We think we kind of trace back, because we think a lot of this starts to emerge really over the last 10 years or so, um, where China, you know, it's not necessarily that China's going to go on some crazy uh, realm of Hitler-style conquest across the rest of the world, but China's had to take a number of policies that ironically have actually in some ways tightened the strategic problems that it faces. So to rejuvenate its economy after 2008, it starts turning really heavily to industrial policy, round after round of massive stimulus as a way to save its own economy. But that obviously brings it into more trade conflict with partners who are saying, look, something like Made in China 2025 is a gross protectionist uh, barrier on the rest of the world. Or China says, look, we need more export markets abroad after 2008 because our traditional export markets are closing up. Um, and so they have something like Belt and Road, where they start showering you know, upwards of a trillion dollars around the world to gin up demand for Chinese uh, you know, construction contracts and exports. But that then leads to accusations of debt trap diplomacy. It causes China to have this, this far-flung economic empire of assets all around the world. So then China has to start building up the naval capacity in order to protect those assets and actually change its doctrine to start doing more far seas protection. That further alarms other powers. And so it's like this sort of finger trap that as things get tough, great powers have to take decisive actions. And those often bring them into greater conflict with other great powers. We think this helps explain some of China's so-called assertiveness over the last decade or so. And we worry that it's just a preview of what may come in the years ahead, because it just looks like many of these pressures, you know, economically, there's a lot of just structural pressures that are hard for China to change. And strategically, it just seems like the wind is pushing more in an anti-China um, direction. And we go back through history and try to show that this is a pattern that repeats over and over again, um, sometimes with catastrophic consequences. Yeah, so I, I think Mike has covered nicely. I'll just make a, a couple of comments to try to flush out of a couple of points of this. I mean, first, I think it's, it's probably appropriate to say here that this is very much an, an AI book in the sense that uh, we got the idea to write the book uh, in a, a AI uh, defense policy seminar that we did back during the pandemic when Mike was giving a presentation on a paper that he was writing about the issue of what happens when fast-growing powers slow down, and I realized that there were some interesting parallels to something that I had written uh, a year or two before that, and so we, we started talking, and the collaboration really uh, flowed out of that, and so it's, it's a product of the intellectual environment here at AEI, and I just wish that Derek had been there, because he could have told us that the book wasn't worth writing. <laughs> <laughs> it saved us just, a, just year, assume a I say lives, that every right? time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let me, let me just uh, make kind of three points, and they, they correspond to, to one of the things we try to do in the book, which is, uh, I guess the way I would put it is to, to bust some common myths about the U.S.-China relationship and about the trajectory of great power relations in general. And, and the first myth, or at least busting the myth, I know is something that is near and dear to Corey's heart, and this oh is busting God, the Thucydides myth of the Thucydides trap. Right? And so mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure many people in the room have, have heard this notion, which is that you get uh, what political scientists call hegemonic war, basically war between uh, the foremost powers in the system when you have a rising power that is overtaking, overtaking or threatening to overtake an established power. The established power kind of freaks out in response to that. <laughs> 
and you get a spiral of tensions that, that leads to war. Uh, and it is, it is so called uh, because that is uh, how Graham Allison of Harvard University interprets what Thucydides mm -hmm. may have said about the, the Peloponnesian <laughs> War. Now, as you can tell, I'm a little bit skeptical of this. It's, it's undeniable that when you have shifting power dynamics in the international system, it creates friction. Uh, you wouldn't be seeing the same level of friction between the United States and China Today, if China still accounted for 2% of global GDP, as it did at the beginning uh, of the 1990s, so that much is undeniable. But there are some real problems with the Thucydides trap, both theoretically and, and historically. Historically, it's, it's not actually clear that the Thucydides trap even explains the onset of the Peloponnesian War, which is a point that uh, the, the late great historian of uh, the ancient world, Donald Kagan, uh, made in, in a number of his books about that conflict. And it's also not clear, kind of conceptually, if you are a country that is rising, if you think that tomorrow is going to be better than today, your position will be better a year from now, 10 years from now, why you would rock the boat so aggressively? Why wouldn't you just wait and assume that time was on your side and you'd be able to get what you want peacefully down the road? And in fact, uh, what we often see is the revisionist powers, countries that want to reorder the international system, they become most aggressive and erratic and risk prone <laughs> not when they think they are confidently rising forever into the future, but when they worry that their power has peaked and begun to decline. And this brings me to the second myth that I think we, we try to explode in the book, which really has to do with the origins of some of the great power wars of the 20th century, and particularly World War I. I think there, there is uh, still a pretty pervasive misunderstanding of why World War I comes about. I think it's captured in the idea that the great power is kind of accidentally sleepwalked into war, I, I think what the evidence points to instead is that you had a Germany that had been rising for decades uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, but then became very nervous in the years running up to 1914 that its power had peaked relative to its rivals, rivals that it had antagonized through its own behavior. And so Germany looks out at the world, it sees a tightening alignment between France and Russia and Britain, it sees major changes in the French and Russian militaries that are going to leave Germany in a really bad place a few years from now. And so German leaders make a conscious decision not to provoke a global war in the summer of 1914, but to run risks that they understood could lead to a global war because they worried that this was essentially their last best chance to break through the ring of encirclement that they themselves had created. And, and that's a similar scenario we worry about with respect to China today. But the third myth that, that I think we want to take on here is this idea that sort of the slide toward confrontation, the slide toward war with China is inevitable. That, that's not what we're arguing in, in the book. We very much hope that it is not because, as Mike has pointed out, a war between the United States and China would be catastrophic. It would inflict a level of economic uh, destruction that would make the, that inflicted by the Ukraine war look minor by comparison. It would have horrific... Uh, humanitarian and strategic consequences, it could very easily escalate to involve nuclear weapons. And so the task for the United States is to, to rapidly take the steps that will make a move to disrupt the, uh, the Western Pacific balance of power militarily unattractive even for a more risk acceptant Xi Jinping. And there are a lot of things that the United States can do in partnership with Taiwan, in partnership with its allies and friends in the region uh, to make that happen, and they don't require defying the laws of physics. They just require going faster to field capabilities, a lot of which are already in existence today. And, and so the appeal that we're making in the book is, is not to look at this uh, subject through the lens of, of sort of fatalism, to assume that conflict is inevitable, but to just realize that we have only a relatively short period of time in which to, to shore up our defenses, to strengthen our position so that it looks unattractive or even a more risk except in China to use force. Excellent. Derek Scissors. Uh, I should say at the beginning, I am not qualified to address the military issues. Um, if Oriana hadn't decided that she hated water and moved to California as a result, um, she could be here to do that. Uh, I hope Corey will do that. I hope you guys will do that. Uh, fortunately, there's plenty of, of material on the econ side for me to discuss, but it isn't everything. So I want to start with that, that uh, exception. Um, I have a line from the intro, which is not me grabbing one sentence from the book and saying, aha, there's a mistake in the sentence. I actually agree with this, adding my own uh, <laughs> emphasis. This is referring to Xi Jinping, because he knew his moment of opportunity wouldn't last long. Again, I put the emphasis in there. 
Um, I agree with it when it's rendered that way, but the, the headline of my reaction to the book is, China does not have a moment of opportunity. She does. Um, the argument for the U.S. to worry about exceptionally about the next five years, for example, is more political than structural. And again, I am not talking about the military side, so, so please remember that. Um, you're not supposed to make reviews of other people's work about yourself, but I have to inject a somewhat <laughs> relevant, um, personally motivated comment. Um, the U.S. is not serious about its competition with China. I, I disagree on the econ side. I disagree with the, the, the statements to that effect that the authors have made. I disagree with a lot of other people more. We just passed a bill where we're pouring money into research in the United States, chips and science. Uh, it's, it's a month and a half ago. We don't have any research safeguards to protect Chinese acquisition of the research. No conceivable serious rivalry occurs in this situation, right? You say, I want to spend a lot of money to have research to compete with China, but I reject the idea that we should seal the research off from China. Now, this is a pet peeve, no question, because I lost that battle politically. But our policy is to speak loudly and carry a twig. China does not face serious U.S. economic pressure. Um, I don't think that refutes their arguments, but I do think it bears on their arguments and also bears on the supposed seriousness of U.S. policy. So the important thing I want to discuss with regard to the book is China's own choices and conditions on the econ side. Um, the book does not make the crisis mistake, which is a lot of people will you know, have discovered China's economic problems, and then they imagine an economic crash, uh, dramatic, that doesn't, doesn't follow at all. Uh, the book may see peaking where I see stagnation, and they're, they're, they overlap in their views, but they're not the same thing. Um, the process of stagnation begins no later than 2011. I, I, think, I think Mike actually referred to that. It starts under Hu Jintao, continues under Xi Jinping. It's very unlikely to change as Xi remains in power. He's not going to discover uh, after the Party Congress uh, next month or after the National People's Congress early next year that, oh, I was wrong about everything. I want to change my, my approach to the economy. China has chosen to undermine its economic development for political reasons, and there's no reason to think that that will, that will change. Uh, debt has weighed down since 2011 because of a monetary policy panic during the global financial crisis. Demography has done so in the form of a shrinking labor force since 2014, repression of private property rights and wealth creation. It gets worse in some sectors in 2019, which I think everyone's avail, uh, aware of, the attack on private tech, but it worsened in other sectors in 2007, and of course in some sectors there is no private participation allowed. Um, there's nothing new or acute here. The problems are long-term and they're chronic. Um, so you should not expect a, 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 an event, right? There's not, in my view, going, it's unlikely to yield an economic peak that is recognizable when it happens, uh, in part because China will lie, but in part because that's just not the way the economic trajectory looks. Um, it may not even yield a peak that's sharply defined in hindsight. Uh, I, I see, you know, 75-year-old me limping onto the stage here and saying, you still can't find the peak, Hal. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we do this with the Soviet Union. We argue about the decline of the Soviet Union. I, I think we may be arguing, we argue about the stagnation in Japan. I think we may we be argue doing that. about World War I. Yes, exactly. And I, I don't think we're going to be able to see, even in hindsight, a, a, a clear peak. China is going to grow very slowly. It will not be rich by any reasonable standard, and by reasonable, I'm excluding the World Bank. Um, but personal income will still slowly rise. The environment will improve. It will be the first or second largest national economy on a range of measurements for 20 years at least. Could be longer, depending on how everybody else handles their business. The real change is that from 1979 to roughly 2014, we can argue about that end date, the dynamism in U.S.-China comparisons was on the Chinese side. And it has gone away. And now the dynamism, including to the downside, is actually on the American side. China is, is, is the slow mover, and we are potentially the faster mover. Um, Hal asked me, and it's not his fault if I screw this up, to talk about possible policy changes. Um, I don't see this as very likely because, you know, it's 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th year of Xi Jinping. But they could move faster on labor mobility and stave off democratic, demographic contraction. It, it's still coming, but it could come later. Um, she probably fears sociopolitical instability from, from more migration. Uh, if a successor comes in, this is a technical and time-consuming challenge. 
It's there. You can have more labor mobility and a better uh, utilized labor force, but it's hard. Um, they could boost uh, income by, uh, with a true rural land market. That would be a game changer. No one talks about it because this door has been open for years and has not been taken, including by Xi's successors. Um, there's a serious ideological barrier, even if Xi wasn't a, a Maoist. Um, he's clearly not going to shrink the state sector, which means China's going to continue to waste money and suppress innovation. I mean, he's about as committed to that as he can be. The next leader might, um, so there's upside there. But the most likely downside is, the, is politically induced economic paralysis in the transition. I mean, it's not an accident Xi Jinping will not even touch on a successor. We actually had the last group that I was in contact with, senior group from China, and they said, what can we do to build trust? And I said, Xi Jinping can name a successor. Dead silence. <laughs> they didn't have talking points for that. No one was going to say a word. Okay? So what, he has deliberately cultivated a situation where the succession is going to be very difficult. And in that ser situation, you have the chance for sharper economic downside. So there are reform steps out there that they could take. There's absolutely no sign they're going to. They would have upside. Uh, the new leader that su succeeds Xi whenever that happens, five years, 10 years, who knows, could take those steps but they're that much longer into demographic contraction, and that transition itself represents uh, an economic downside. So I didn't, you know, I, I tried to lay out where uh, I think the book is a little too dramatic. Um, on the econ side, these are not new problems, they are not acute problems. However, on the military side, the story may be different, so happy to hear from all of you. So let's start with the economic case. And Michael, I want to give you the chance to, um, to reclama Derek's uh, comments. Since you have done so much work on the economics of China's stagnation, um, and I think you and Derek both agree that GDP is actually a terrible measure of the economic salience of a country. So, so what do you think of Derek's case, how does it impact the arguments you and Hal make in the book? Well, as an armchair strategist, I have a rule to when your critics are saying things you agree with, uh, you should probably just shut up and let them continue <laughs> to talk. So I basically, I mean, I agree with essentially everything that Derek just said, all of the problems and the, the just the not, there just aren't prospects for easy fixes to these economic problems that China faces. I think where we differ is how dramatic, how different is this? You know, Derek is saying these are long term problems, which I agree, the origins are structural and are sort of baked into China's economic growth model and just its, its demographics and things that are very difficult to change. But I, I do think that we, it's possible to underestimate the sense to which there are really like crisis level problems. Like, you know, in 2007, the growth rate was 15%. What's the growth rate in China today? You know, back in the 2000s, debt was under 100% of GDP. It's, you know, approaching three times the size of China's economy today, if you just look at something like the mortgage crisis today, we're in what, more than 100 cities around China, you have people banding together to protest and say, we're not going to pay mortgages on buildings that are half built. And there's videos online of people bulldozing buildings that are half built. I mean, this just does not seem like a normal, gradual, all part of the master plan kind of process to me. This seems a much more dire situation. Now, I don't think there's any kind of financial crisis in the cards because the biggest lenders and the biggest borrowers are, you know, all part of the same uh, party. Um, but in terms of just, you know, is the GDP going to have to take a haircut? Probably because, you know, like the ghost cities and all these apartments that are empty are wasting assets. They're going to have to be cut out. Uh, is there any prospect for rejuvenating the economy and getting back to steady growth? It doesn't seem like it, given the political economy and what Xi Jinping wants to do. Um, and given that he's willing to clearly sacrifice economic efficiency if it enhances his political um, control. So I guess, I guess where we differ is just how, how managed can this process really be, and does the regime feel like it has to take bold steps, which I think it's already taken a number. I mean, like the industrial policy they've rolled out, they're spending twice as much as the United States, even though obviously they're a poor country on a per capita basis. Um, and something like Belt and Road, you know, these show grand ambitions for this country that's not just going to sit back and allow the sort of natural, oh, we'll glide down to the second or third largest economy in the world and just kind of play our part. I just, if you read what Chinese strategists have been saying, they have extremely high ambitions. And these kind of economic problems that they're facing now aren't just 
oh, a, a secular slowdown. I mean, these are serious debilitating crises that China faces. So I noticed that Megan Green in her column in the Financial Times comes down on your side of the argument this morning with the column about debt, disease, and drought, uh, meaning that China's growth is faltering. But Derek, I want to ask you that it seems like the Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party's theory of control of the country has been that the Chinese people will trade prosperity, will trade um, politics in order to get prosperity. If prosperity, if the prosperity side of the equation is faltering, do you think that creates a political or a legitimacy crisis for Xi Jinping, or can he navigate this? And then Hal, I want to hear your answer to the same question. So I will go back to a statement I used to use all the time before the pandemic made everything void. It was um, made by a then member of the Politburo to me, and his response to that was, old people don't riot. <laughs> um, which is wonderful. Uh, and he said it in English, too, in case my Chinese wasn't up to understanding him. Um, so, you know, you have, as I suggested, uh, I think Michael frames this properly. To the extent China has these, you know, grandiose ambitions, the economy is not going to support those. There's going to have to be something that goes along with them. In other words, you're not going to have the rapid growth rates uh, that you want to become a, a, the dominant economy in the world, if China ever thought that was possible, the way the U.S. has been for decades. Um, so you have, to you have to have a different strategy. You strangle supply chains, right? You, you, you give up on comparative advantage. You're going to lose the wealth that, that people might get, but you're getting more leverage over everyone else to back them off of contesting uh, your political, uh, your geopolitical claims. Um, so the era, China, you know, China can't imagine an era of leadership comparable to the U.S. era. It has to imagine something else. I don't think they're capable of that either. But I think the Hal and Mike are right that their recognition of that incapability could be a little bit dicey for all of us. Um, with regard to the trade-off, you know, I just don't see it. You know, people say this all the time, but everyone's going to have a job because the labor force is shrinking. Right? It's, there, we still have this one bubble coming out of college, um, and it's going to pass, and then demographic wave is going is to shrink the ensuing uh, age cohorts. Everyone's going to have a job. The environment's going to be cleaner. There's not going to be, unless it's self-induced, a dramatic crisis where people's uh, livelihoods are taken away. Um, compared to previous problems the Chinese Communist Party has faced, Great Leap Forward, mm -hmm. Cultural Revolution, Tiananmen, this looks fine. So the problem isn't with ordinary people being furious at the party for you know, denying them the enormous wealth they thought they had. There could be a problem with corruption, which the party is very aware of, and unequal wealth distribution, but it's not the prosperity of ordinary people. It would have to be more, as Michael said, frustration of Xi and, and a few, you know, his allied elites that China will not get to the place that allows them to do everything they want. It's an elite problem, in my view, not a mass problem. Hence, the anti-corruption campaign hmm. was aimed at elites. Hmm. Interesting. How, uh, so if uh, two, hmm. two alternative theories I'd love to hear your thoughts on. If Elizabeth Bra were here, she would say China's compensating for the faltering of individual economic prospects with an increasingly repressive surveillance state. So they can substitute internally by tighter control. And if Nadej Roland were here, she would say, uh, China is, understands it's never going to have positive relations with the West. And in fact, the West may eventually adopt Derek's sensible economic advice and shut off Chinese access to research, to innovation, to supply chain um, dominance. But that doesn't matter because China is building an international order with what China calls the global south. And so it has a successful global strategy that doesn't depend on the West or on confrontation with the West. So I'll take the, the second one first, just because I think it actually fits fairly nicely with what we, we argue in the book. And in fact, we draw on, on Nadezhda's work. And so you, you don't have to go back that far 
to get to a point where it looked as though large swaths of the advanced democratic world might find themselves enmeshed, at least partially, in a Chinese technological sphere of influence. So if you go back to the 5G debates in, in Europe and the UK in 2019, uh, really leading up to the beginning of COVID, there was a significant prospect at that point that Huawei or other Chinese providers were going to build the backbone of the 5G telecommunications systems with potentially very significant economic and geopolitical ramifications. I think that, that prospect has largely been averted now. And so if you look at kind of the OECD countries or whatever collection of advanced democracies you want to look at, more and more of them are doing what, what Mike referenced, which is basically finding ways, whether explicitly or implicitly, to put up barriers to China, Chinese technological influence in their economy, where that is not happening to, to nearly the same degree as in the developing world. So sort of, you know, Mao would have called it the intermediate zone. It's the global south today, whatever you want to call it. And I think this is really central to Chinese ambitions in the coming years uh, to, to carve out what we would look at as a technological sphere of influence that pays economic um, intelligence, geopolitical, perhaps military dividends over, over the long term. And I think that is a, a, a semi-realistic prospect. On the first question that you asked, and kind of going back to the, the exchange between uh, Derek and Mike, I, I do think that if, if you're looking at a future in which China, Chinese citizens are enjoying a lesser level of prosperity than they might have expected or that they might have been led to expect, it creates a challenge of a narrowed base of legitimacy for the regime. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get a collapse of the regime. It doesn't mean you're going to get people out in the streets. I think, I think Derek is, is right about that. But just kind of logically, if you think about it, since 1989, um, the legitimacy of the CCP has basically rested on two pillars. The first is economic performance, and the second is a hyped up version of, of nationalism. As, as one of those pillars weakens, even if it's only a matter of degree, the CCP will have to decide whether it wants to live with a narrowed base of legitimacy or do something else. And something else could be, it could be leaning harder on the nationalist pillar of, of legitimacy in, in some ways that we've already seen. It could be tripling down on a repressive surveillance state. We, we've seen that as well. It could be trying to find new ways of ideologically mobilizing the population. And we see that with some of sort of the, the neo-Maoist rhetoric and, and slogans and policies of, of Xi Jinping. So there are a variety of levers that the Chinese government can try to pull if it starts to think that it has a legitimacy problem due to slowing economic growth. The point I would make is that none of those levers look very pretty from our perspective. That They all have the potential to create geopolitical problems. And in fact, that's part of the logic that we're getting at here. Uh, so I see our esteemed colleague Mackenzie Eaglin in the room, mm -hmm. um, and she uh, she prosecutes an argument parallel to Derek's in the military realm, which is that we are fundamentally unserious about the military mm -hmm. challenge China is posing, in particularly and in its sharpest near-term application to the sovereignty and independence of Taiwan. You guys talk about that in the book. Um, talk us through it. I, I, we should invite Mackenzie up here because we draw <laughs> very heavily on her work. Um, I mean, she's exactly right. I mean, the United States, as Derek said, is talking extremely loudly. Pelosi's trip is just the latest example of that. But at the same time, it still puts a lot of its military eggs in a very small number of baskets. It's still heavily reliant on these giant multi-role platforms that are great for doing all kinds of peacetime missions and showing the flag, but not so great when you have, you know, hypersonics flying at you um, and you're trying to dodge a bunch of Chinese mines. I think Mackenzie's work has been extremely valuable for us because she's, kind of, she's helped explain how this happens because defense experts have been saying the United States needs to spread out its base infrastructure, harden its bases, have lots of different shooters and lay down this sort of high-tech minefield in critical areas that make conquest or a blockade impossible, and yet there's been relatively little reform in the force structure and posture of the U.S. military, and she helps, helps you understand that by looking at the incentives of you know, combatant commanders and uh, commanders who want these, uh, these kind of platforms and just kind of the bureaucratic and political obstacles to that. So we're left at a position now where it still is very possible for China to carry out a Pearl Harbor-style strike, not just on bases on Taiwan, but on the bases on Okinawa, possibly even Guam, given that they have a Guam killer 
missile designed exactly to do that and to sink American aircraft carriers. And so even though the U.S. has these big, powerful guns, they're just incredibly vulnerable and have fed into the strategy that the Chinese, I mean, it's not hard to find Chinese writings that tell you exactly what the strategy is if there is going to be a massive war over Taiwan, and we just haven't uh, made the adaptations at, at a fast enough time frame, which is one of the main motivations of writing the book. So how, what should the strategy be for managing this China? What are we not doing that we need to be doing? I think I'd say that the, the direction of travel in U.S. policy isn't wrong. It's that the speed of travel is, is off. And so to, to pick up on what Mike was saying, I think the U.S. and its allies are actually serious about getting ready for a crisis or conflict with China. They're just assuming it's going to happen in 2033, right? And, and so we may be serious about that crisis. We're not serious about the crisis or conflict that may be coming in 2025. And I, and I think one of the reasons why you got sort of the quasi-panicked reaction in large parts of Washington over the crisis triggered by Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan was a realization that the level of no kidding military danger in the Western Pacific is higher than we thought, and it may manifest sooner than we thought, and, and we are not ready, right? And so uh, if you're looking at this from, from a military perspective, the good news is that there's actually quite a lot that the United States and its allies and friends can do to shore up the balance of power in the Western Pacific. You know, we, we often talk about um, invading Taiwan as though it's sort of like flipping a switch, but this would be a massively complex and difficult operation. It would, would require crossing lots of relatively choppy water, trying to seize ports or, or land on a handful of beaches that are suitable for an amphibious uh, assault. Uh, it would require conquering terrain that is very favorable to the defense because it's made up of, of jungles and mountains and dense urban and environments. And so the, the sort of short version of this is that in some ways Taiwan is a natural fortress. It's a defender's dream if you can stock up with the right kind of weapons. And again, the good news is that the right kind of weapons in, in this instance are, are mostly things that already exist today. They're an, anti-ship missiles, uh, drones, uh, UUVs, uh, a tritable ISR, and, and so on and so forth. Basically things that can inflict a very high cost on a Chinese invasion fleet as it comes across the Taiwan Strait, and buy time for the United States and its allies to, to intervene. And so thing one we need to be doing is going much, much faster in terms of acquiring those capabilities for ourselves and helping the Taiwanese acquire and field them as well. Thing two would be to, to go much faster in terms of developing no kidding um, uh, sort of quasi-multilateral plans for how to handle a Taiwan contingency. That the, one of the major challenges we face in the Western Pacific is there's, there's no NATO out there. There's no body that would coordinate uh, a multilateral response, and so it's going to be more of a pickup game. The good news is that there are more and more countries in the region and beyond that are signaling that they would not be indifferent to a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. The Japanese have pretty clearly indicated that they could not stand by and watch this happen. The Australians are in the same place. You're seeing uh, sort of quieter signals from a variety of other countries. But what we really be ne need to do is be moving much faster on no kidding uh, staff talks and military consultations that would help us figure out how to operate together in a crisis and help us figure out how to operate with the Taiwanese because this is complicated because we don't actually have diplomatic relations with Taiwan. We don't have anywhere near the same military relationship with Taiwan that we did even with Ukraine. And so basically the, the order of the day is to go faster on a variety of ideas that I think defense planners have known about for, for a decade in some cases because we're simply out of time for a go slow approach. So we have some great questions coming in. While folks in the room are thinking of theirs, let me read a couple. The first from Congressman Steve Chabot's office. What legislative action should Congress take in the next six months to maximize U.S. ability to deter China from taking aggressive action in the danger zone? I feel like Hal gave a partial answer. I want to hear Derek's answer. Uh, well, the next six months uh, is pretty rough because you don't have much leeway. But we could start in the next six months and again, from the econ side, uh, there's an obvious way the Chinese can coerce the Taiwanese. It, it, economically, it has to do with mostly with energy. But the number one thing I worry about in a Taiwan scenario, if it occurs in the short term, is it's, this is a rough estimate, but something like 55% of the chemical inputs that are used in global, ph global pharmaceuticals are manufactured in China. Um, it's not that the final product 
is necessarily manufactured in China, but everybody who makes the final product has a, has a dependent relationship on the Chinese, and it has to do with subsidies, it has to do with environmental, you know, ignoring environmental consequences. I don't want to go down that road, but if we're thinking that in the short term there is a reason, the short term not being six months, um, but, but our preparation in the next six months, we have to take steps so that Americans don't think, if we fight over Taiwan, I will not get my life-saving medicine. And we are in that position now. And again, there's a direct effect from imports from China. There's an indirect effect from imports from other countries who are ultimately supplied by the Chinese. I could move down the line of supply chains, but that's the one that I think you know, is the most scary in terms of America's will to fight, in terms of a future American president saying, what did the Chinese just threaten me with? And, and not being willing uh, to take the steps necessary. So, you know, the, the person who, who wrote the question, excellent question, you may have a different chief economic worry, but we don't want to face economic coercion in a Taiwan scenario. It, just like the military side, this problem cannot be solved in a matter of months, which means we have to start as soon as we possibly can. Excellent. Questions from folks in the room? Yes. Hi, my name is Laurel Schwartz. I just returned from being the principal of a Chinese Canadian school in Beijing. And there have been rumors that perhaps there is going to be some competition next month for Xi at the, the Congress, the National People's Congress. What if that happens and he's not able to get his third term? How does that change your thesis? Can I start? I think that's extremely unlikely. And the reason is, and, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, but it would fit with my view of Hal and Mike's argument, he would be freaking out right now if that were the case. And we, there was an opportunity with Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, which I think was a good thing, don't get me wrong, there was an opportunity for him to freak out and say, oh, it's not me protecting my position, it's the Americans provoking us trying to change the status quo on Taiwan, and he didn't do it. Um, I've read some of the articles you may have. You're coming from Beijing. You may have heard have different sources of information. Some of the articles here are not well-founded. Uh, if I, so I, I don't take them seriously. It's always possible that someone could look at Xi Jinping's track record, which on the economic side is poor, and say, I'm not giving you a blank check for the next 10 years. So we could see, rather than him being replaced, more subtle constraints on his power. And that is going to be a very difficult interpretation job. I've been following Chinese politics for 25 years. If you ask me whether I'll be able to sign, find those, those constraints, I'll be like, do you have a coin? That, that's where I am on my chances. Um, so I don't think he's going to be replaced. I think we would see very different Chinese behavior to now if that were the case. Could he have the same, uh, you know, less of a free hand than he's had so far? Yes. We'll, we might see that after the National People's Congress. We might. Uh, I don't think we'll see anything beforehand. The Chinese are not going to stand up and say, hi, we're having political divisions. Everybody take advantage of that. Maybe just one thing to add on this. I mean, I think I would totally agree with, with Derek on this. I think the major question is sort of, you know, how successful will he be in, in stacking the system with his acolytes, not whether he will get the, the third term. But there is a larger question about what happens after Xi Jinping in, in China. And there is a potential for real political instability there for the reason that Derek has talked about, which is that uh, she has basically stripped away a lot of the guardrails and succession procedures that were put in place after Mao Zedong's death to provide continuity and stability in the system. And so after he goes, whether that's in 2027 or you know, whether it's because he retires and goes off to live in the countryside or something bad happens to him or, or whatever, there is, there is more uncertainty about who would be positioned to control the system at that point now than I think there has been in previous transitions. And, and one of the things that we, we talk about in the conclusion of the book is that there are actually a lot of different ways the Chinese system could go after Xi Jinping leaves power. You, you can imagine somebody who would come in and point to a lot of economic failures and say, actually, there are policy levers we should pull that will require surrendering a little bit of political control, but we're gonna do it to get the economy back on track. Or you can imagine a successor coming from sort of the radical nationalist wing of the PLA. And, and you get a China that's actually more aggressive, even though it doesn't address some of the fundamental drivers of, of economic stagnation. And so when, when I look at sort of where you could get real no kidding instability in China, it's not as a result of 
economic crisis. It's as, as a result of a very uncertain political succession that, that Xi Jinping himself is doing a lot to bring about. So I remember hearing Susan Shirk more than 20 years ago say that we are all underestimating the prospect of central control of China evaporating. And that, so, so not quite a collapse of the Soviet Union, but, but the ability of Beijing to control the rest of the country, which does appear to be a genuine fear of the Chinese leadership being a result of that kind of, um, that kind of political uh, scenario. Couple more questions. Uh, one, we answered part of, but there's a sharp edge to it that I think merits addressing. Realistically, given Chinese military and defense industrial base trajectories, will the US be in a better position to confront China if necessary today or in five or seven years? I mean, it all depends on what the United States does on current trajectory, it's probably going to get worse for the United States. I mean, this to us is the nightmare scenario where China faces a number of headwinds on the economic front. There's political issues, but at the same time is coming off this wave of massive military modernization, you know, churning out warships at a rate we haven't seen for many countries since World War II, and could easily ramp up <laughs> that uh, modernization in the future if, if they're willing to just tighten belts at home and divert more spending towards uh, the military. And so if the United States just allows current trends to continue, it could be increasingly outmatched, especially given that the most likely scenarios for a war between two countries obviously would be close to China. China would have home field advantage um, and could, could nullify big parts of the existing air and naval forces that the US has, many, much of which was built you know, in the Reagan administration in a, in a different era and is just not well suited to the type of uh, combat that we're likely to see um, in the Taiwan Strait or even in some South China Sea contingencies. One, one, of, one of the things we have, uh, I think, learned from the war in Ukraine is just how dramatically unprepared the U.S. is, particularly the defense industrial base, for any sort of conflict with China. If you look at the expenditure of munitions, if you look at the difficulty we would have in replacing lost ships with, with planes, it's a little bit of a better uh, picture, but, but lost capital assets, uh, in general, this this is not the U.S. economy of 1939, 1940, where it's the world's leader in manufacturing, and you've got lots and lots of spare industrial capacity because of the Great Depression. You've got very little spare industrial capacity, and so we would face real challenges in terms of getting beyond, you know, the first three weeks or three months of a China conflict. There there may be various workarounds to that. I mean, you may be able to lean on. Uh, allies who have uh, greater industrial capacity in things like shipbuilding, where Japan could perhaps play uh, an important role, or Korea, perhaps. But I think one of the things we're, we're learning, fortunately, from somebody else's war rather than our own, is that if we want to be ready to, to fight, and, and thereby ready to deter a conflict with China, we're going to need a lot more resilience in the defense industrial base and the manufacturing base than we have today. So Derek, I was actually going to ask you to comment <laughs> both the... Um, yeah. The politics of Taiwan's increasing uh, de facto uh, independence and the fact that the United States has the ability to correct these problems in a 10-year time window does seem to create an argument of the kind we saw Vladimir Putin's Russia make over the invasion of Ukraine, which is the windows closing um, and if we're going to do this, we need to do this now. I'm not asking you to defend the military piece of the equation in Oriana's absence, but how do you take the logic of that argument? Uh, I mean, to me, the I, I've been saying this for a long time, but I'm just too lazy to write a book about it, um, <laughs> uh, along with 10 articles, uh, the way the two of these guys did. Um, <laughs> Xi Jinping, to, to the question in the audience, it, it, Xi Jinping is under threat at 20, in 2027. I, as I said, as mentioned at the outset, I find that a very scary thought. Um, so there's a political motivation here. You referenced it with Taiwanese behavior. Um, the Chinese intentionally shot themselves in the foot by uh, saying that Hong Kong protests are too embarrassing or whatever the problem was and completely undermining one country, two systems. So they now have a weaker appeal to ordinary people in Taiwan. So there is a political concern here that I, that I agree with. Um, 
The economic side doesn't argue for that. Uh, as I said, the Chinese are not looking at the, you know, Mike and I disagree on this, but the Ch a sensible uh, Chinese leader, which we may not have, is not looking at his problems and going, oh my goodness, I didn't know these existed three years ago. They did. Six years ago, they did. Nine years ago, they did. Um, I am facing a, and no, no, these two did not say that. Some people do. Um, I'm facing a collapse in 2025 or 2027, and I'm, uh, that's not the case. So the economics doesn't argue for it. The politics and the military, I, I don't know how to address. The politics can, um, because not so much the Taiwan, Taiwan is increasingly in, independent, but because the Chinese, in the a relatively new development, in the last three years now have nothing to offer. Right? They don't have anything to offer other than coercion. And you know, watching, if, you, if for any of you who are watching what has happened in Hong Kong, it's really horrible. It's not surprising. Um, it's almost even, in a, a terrible way, boring, because we've seen this script and we knew what was going to happen. But if you're Taiwan, there's no chance of reconciliation under Xi Jinping. You'd have to have a different kind of leader, and they'd have to establish themselves. So they have to replace Xi Jinping and establish themselves as a different kind of leader, for example, liberalizing domestically, and survive that, that's a long way off. And so she may think, you know, uh, for my own benefit, what, what great achievements have I wrought? Certainly not economic achievements. Um, I will, you know, that, that's what, what forces his hand. I don't think it's really in Taiwan. I don't think it's the United States. I don't think it's Chinese economics. I think it's him. That is bracing. We have time for one last question over here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Siddhant, and I'm an international security graduate student. Uh, my question is on the lines of the most recent development. So currently, there is a military drill going between uh, China and Russia, which has also having a many aligned uh, state actors, such as uh, India and many Central Asian countries, including Mongolia. So they're having a joint military drill. and. The United States has already expressed some amount of discomfort with India joining it, given, given its neutrality with uh, its, the war in Ukraine. So how does the NATO, as well as the United States, view this kind of military uh, alliance going between Russia and China, which has strengthened over the last six months? I'll just have give a quick answer, and then Mike would like to say anything. But the, I think the short answer is that the Russia-China relationship has gone farther than nearly anybody in D.C. anticipated it would 25 years ago, even perhaps a decade uh, ago. And it actually does deliver some pretty significant benefits for both countries. I think the, the primary one is, is often overlooked, which is that they just don't have to militarize their border in, anymore. And so Russia has basically stripped the Russian Far East of all meaningful military assets in the current war with Ukraine and pushed them uh, over uh, into its, its western flank. China can do the same thing in a conflict, whether that's with, with India or with the United States in the western Pacific. And the fact that both countries are applying pressure on the international system in different places at the same time creates real problems for the United States because we just don't have the bandwidth, military or otherwise, to deal with that effectively. I, I do think you're seeing some indications in the Ukraine crisis of how this Russia-China tie-up may eventually end, in, in the sense that you're going to end up with a Russia that is much more economically and technologically dependent on China, which Putin may be fine with, but lots of Russian nationalists won't like very much over a 10, 15 year period. And you're gonna have a China that's a little bit annoyed with Russia, or maybe a lot annoyed with Russia for doing things that blow back strategically on China. People are taking the threat of an invasion of Taiwan more seriously now because Putin invaded Ukraine. I don't think that makes a difference in the next decade. I don't think it makes a difference as long as Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin are in power. The, the logic of this alignment is, is very strong. And if either country turns away from its partner, it has no one to turn toward at this point. But under a different, set of Russian and Chinese leaders a decade or 15 years from now, perhaps you start to see a loosening for these reasons. And I would commend to you Hal Brand's 
uh, column in Bloomberg this week, last week, uh, on Russia, China, and Iran increasingly coordinating their activity. Michael, anything you'd like to add? Hal, it's like, yeah, Hal's got a column for that. You know, just, <laughs> <laughs> just sprinkle them out and just read this. Um, I mean, I, I obviously agree with Hal. I think it's, it goes beyond, though, just obviously the military problems of these two countries being able to fight back to back and kind of guard their rear flank. I think it, it possibly, you know, you mentioned. India, uh, you know, sets up the core of what could be a, an ideological um, uh, assault because, you know, and this is something we haven't talked about in this discussion yet, but what role does ideology play in competition with China and with Russia? They clearly want a world where color revolutions don't happen, you know, where authoritarian regimes are resilient. China has pioneered the most advanced technologies that make repression extremely affordable and efficient in a way that we've never seen, I don't think, in in the, human, in the human existence. Um, and if they can bind together with Russia, they can bring in, you know, India, okay, it's a democracy, but, you know, I'm, the more I look at Indian politics, the more worried I get um, about how committed, uh, you know, the Indian state is to democratic institutions. And then obviously with authoritarian regimes around the world to promote this alternative vision, they just seem to be on their feet in a way that they weren't in, certainly in the 1990s or even the early 2000s, where they had, kind of had to pay lip service to democratic principles because that's where the zeitgeist was. Now it just seems like there's this clear ideological alternative of the benefits of a harmonious, well-ordered, hierarchical society. And even if they start squabbling with each other, if they're able to promote that vision, I mean, that can redound even within a country like the United States, let alone among fledgling democracies around the world that, you know, uh, where d democratic institutions may not be entrenched. I think in terms of breaking these things apart, I mean, Hal, Hal has written a, a great column, not surprisingly, about how in the short term, the United States may actually have to push Russia and China closer together to eventually break them apart. I mean, this is something the Eisenhower administration kind of counted on uh, with the Soviets and the Chinese saying, well, if they get more dependent on each other, they're gonna realize, it's like when you, you're friends with someone and suddenly you decide to room with them and you have to start paying bills together and like everything. And, you know, that's when the real fights begin and it, and it actually happened when the Sino-Soviet split where Mao is like, you're using us as a, a submarine base and you know, you're not giving us the nukes and all the other stuff you promised us. And you could see something similar with Russia and China today. I don't think Putin is thrilled that people are talking about Russia as a pimple on China's nose or a vassal state. I don't think the Chinese are thrilled about announcing a no-limits partnership and then having their allies start the largest war in Europe since uh, World War II. And be bad at it. And be really bad at it, you know, make, make authoritarian conquests look bad. So, I mean, um, there's, there's at least the possibility for, uh, you know, eventually breaking them apart given all their differences. But the problem is that you probably actually have to push them together. I, there's no reverse Kissinger here that's gonna break these two countries apart. Okay, in closing, I would like each of the three of you sparklers to, um, to make one point either that you think is incredibly important that hasn't come up yet, or that you wanna make sure people walk away from this conversation with, starting with you, Derek. Um, I think I've said everything important. Of course, I always think that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do, you know, um, if, I, I, you know, on the econ side, as I said, I think they're being too dramatic and we face a long-term challenge. Uh, that should not be used as an excuse because we haven't really started. We have not had the process of, of taking on American business interests in China and saying, you are secondary to what we're trying to accomplish in terms of national security. Um, and, and if we tried to do it, it, you know, let's say a war starts tomorrow. It's going to be incredibly disruptive to our economy. We don't want that. We want to prepare in advance so it's going to be disruptive, but it's going to be less disruptive. Um, I'll just make another concrete policy comment. There are more rumors about the Biden administration having a, a, an executive order limiting outbound investment. Uh, I'll believe in the quality of that executive order when I see it, <laughs> but the real point is we now freely invest in Chinese technology. That means we don't want the Chinese buying U.S. technology. We're not supposed to send technology to China, although we do anyway, including the surveillance technology that Mike was just referring to. But if China is developing advanced technology, we can freely send U.S. money to support it. This is not, you know, to get back to Mackenzie's point on the military side, my point on the econ side, we're not serious. And so the faster we start, the less dislocation we're looking at. And until we start, um, this is all sort of pretend 
Now, we have not demonstrated the political will to build up the military to confront the Chinese. Hal Brands. Uh, just because we think the moment of peak danger is coming in the late 2020s doesn't mean that you have no problems after 2030. You can have long competitions that have moments of, of greater or lesser stress. That was true during the Cold War. That'll be true in this competition uh, as well. We've got to get through this, this near-term stretch without having something disastrous happen. But after that, we'll need to settle in for a much longer competition against the China that, that may be stagnating but won't be going away anytime soon. Michael Beckley. Uh, I would say choose your battles. So, you know, because the long-term trends are favorable, the goal is to get to the long game without causing some global conflagration in the short term. A lot of our, and what we focused on here in this discussion, are sort of more ways to get tough with China, more ways to restrict its economic assets, more ways to flood the Taiwan Strait with a bunch of military hardware. But I think, it, you know, in the book, we try to go at pains that there are lessons of history of going too far, of reflexively opposing everything that your adversary does every single place. What we try to do is say, look, what you need to be focused on are the potential near-term successes that China could get that would radically upend the long-term balances of power. That's why we focus on Taiwan, we focus on this sort of economic empire that China's trying to carve out and the, the spread of these digital surveillance technologies. But outside of that, the two countries still need to find ways to get together. They need to talk. There has to be diplomacy. And so you have to avoid the kind of overreaction, the complete embargo on China that could cause it to say, well, what, what point is there in any kind of reconciliation? Why not shoot the moon? There are obviously you know, historical examples that show how that can go disastrously wrong. And you know, things like talking very loudly are just completely counterproductive. You asked about what, you know, the congressman asked, you know, what can we do with our legislation? I would actually go through some of this legislation and cross out a number of things like that, that make no difference to the deterrent of uh, Taiwan, like changing the name of Tecro to make it sound more like an embassy. I mean, what, what good does that do for the people of Taiwan? It certainly feeds into this narrative of a slippery slope in Beijing that the Americans, the rest of the world is only going to get more diabolically committed to making Taiwan independent. We have to draw a line in the sand right now. That just seems completely short-sighted and dangerous. So avoiding those, there's just so many ways the U.S. can make this worse. So just actively trying to look for ways to not do that. Won't you, my friends, join me in thanking Helen and Edward Hintz for the generosity <laughs> to create this book series and these three great scholars and celebrate the book Danger Zone. <laughs>